Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to Discover Economics uh, as part of National Careers Week. We are delighted to have you here today. Uh, absolutely uh, an amazing week, an amazing uh, week of activities that have been happening across the UK and further afield. So it's absolutely super that you've all joined us here today for Discover Economics and our Careers in Economics event. So you might be sat in classrooms at the moment and you might be thinking about what you're going to do next. Now, I, I, I want to ask a few questions just to see, uh, have we got the right audience here? So questions I think about, you know, uh, that some of you might be considering are, you know, are you, are you curious about the society that you live in? Um, are you motivated to tackle real world problems? Do you want to make the world a better place? You know, if these are all questions where you sat there thinking, yeah, actually, I, I am. That's what I want to do. Then brilliant. You're in the right place because that's exactly what economists can do. So today I'm delighted that I'm joined by some super exciting economists from a variety of backgrounds. We've got Zah from the Bank of England. We have Amrit from the University of Kent. We have Tolly from the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and Kostos from KPMG. So a variety of economists that you're going to hear from today telling their journeys, how they use economics and giving you some top tips and guidance as you consider what next, whether it's university or maybe even the apprenticeship routes. And some of you might be thinking the apprenticeship route and economics. I didn't know about that. Well, you'll learn a little bit more. I'm Sam. I'm the campaign manager of Discover Economics, uh, and I'm delighted to lead a campaign where you can access uh, advice and guidance online on our website. Some of you might see us on social media, our newsletters, but we can also come into your schools and deliver taster workshops to young people that maybe don't even have to be studying economics. Because let's remember, not every school actually offers economics, and that shouldn't be a barrier to you. So do check out our website and links. Um, and see if we can come into your school. But you're not here to listen to me. You're here to listen to our amazing guest. And the first guest that I'm going to come to today is Tolly from the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And if I just come to you, Tolly, now, uh, I'd, I'd love for you, as mentioned there at the start, just to share your journey and maybe explain what is the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office? So maybe seen it on the news, but what exactly do you do? And then, um, you know, where are you based? Do you end up traveling as economics helps you see more of the world? Um, so yeah, over to you, Tolly. Please uh, share your journey in economics. Great. Thank you so much, Sam. Yes, in terms of my personal journey, so I studied economics, history and geography at A-level. I didn't do maths, but then I went to study economics and history at the University of Leeds as my bachelor's. After university, I actually worked at the Bank of England for a few years. I really enjoyed it there. And I know we've got uh, Zara on the line from the Bank of England as well. Um, and a couple of years ago, I moved from the Bank of England and joined, as you say, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, or the FCDO uh, for short. So the FCDO is the government uh, department which was responsible for the UK's uh, foreign relations, kind of simply put. As you say, Sam, it involves a lot of international work. Uh, whether that's on development, on reducing poverty, on climate change, uh, working on trade. There's a whole range of issues, kind of pretty much any issue which might have an international uh, element uh, brings in the FCDO. So it's a really interesting place to work. I, I see my role as an economist in the FCDO is bringing kind of that economic analysis and that evidence-based approach to kind of our own policy whether on, on all those kind of range of issues. Um, so I've had, I, I, and I've had a bit of a, a varied route I would say in my career in hindsight things can look like it all made sense but at the time you kind of just take opportunities as they come um, to be honest uh, I think I applied for the foreign office uh, quite a few times uh, and was only successful the final time so you know not everything uh, is always as straightforward as it, as it might seem um, but it's a really fascinating place to work and if as you said at the start I mean, you laid it out really well in terms of using economics to tackle real world problems and that's something I find really rewarding about working at the Foreign Office as an economist is actually working on these real live world problems. And that, that's really kind of what drives me, I think, um, day to day. Brilliant. And yeah, I suppose what 
maybe was the initial trigger for you? Was there a, a role model maybe or someone that inspired you? Or was there something that was happening in the world that you observed and thought, actually, this is something that I, I want to focus on? In terms of economics generally as a subject, I think it was some of the classic um, econo uh, kind of ec economics books that students might be aware of, like The Under of Eco Undercover Economist by Tim Harford, Free Economics, those kind of things, which really got me interested in the subject more, more potentially than actually the, the school subject itself was kind of doing that reading and around it and the podcasts and stuff like that. Um, we also had a outreach, and this is why I think outreach is really important, because we had an outreach competition run by the Bank of England come to my school um, or I was in, I took part and that was something that really spurred my interest in the Bank of England particularly so uh, I think that's kind of what initially led me down down that path of doing economics at university um, and I've always been really interested in international relations and foreign affairs as well so being able to combine those two in my current role is something that's kind of perfect from, from my perspective but I think it was definitely some of those um, and I would definitely recommend those kind of podcasts so more or less by Tim Harford or you know a whole range of kind of material I think they can really bring the subject to life sometimes more than it can in the classroom. Yeah, I think uh, we're really lucky in this day and age that there's such a variety of uh, uh, mediums that you can access that material. And you mentioned the competition there, and now FCDO actually have their own schools competition, which is really exciting. Um, so yeah, a variety of ways, whether you have economics in your classroom or outside the classroom that you can engage it. And, um, and School of Economics does have our own podcast too, so do check that one out. Um, so I suppose... Foreign Commonwealth Development Office, like maybe could you explain a little bit as to like what exactly is that and, and what do you do on a normal day or is there such thing as a normal day? For me personally, it's very varied. So as you say, there's no real two days that are the same for me. I think as an economist, it can be a range of things. Like I said, you could be working on development or uh, kind of testing out the value of our different development programs overseas. Uh, kind of adding that evidence analysis on that side or it could be doing economic analysis of what's happening in economies and countries overseas to help both inform our policymakers there and also um, uh, in the UK and, and, and you, you asked earlier so I should have mentioned on, on where we're based so we have uh, people based in the UK but obviously as the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and Development Office we have um, embassies all around the world embassies and high commissions all around the world so we have representatives often also economists um, overseas as well who are kind of embedded in that country both to support UK nationals who are there, but also to provide that kind of live link to that host nation. Uh, and there's a lot of work that goes on there um, in terms of working with, for example, economic ministries overseas. Um, yeah, so it's definitely a, a mixed bag and I'm hesitant to try and characterize it all as kind of a similar thing because whenever I speak to another economist in the FCDA, everyone does very different jobs. And I think that's one of the really interesting parts of it. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's so somewhat helpful, but perhaps also quite vague, but um, intentionally so. And sorry, yeah, I should have mentioned our school's competition. I'll put the link in the chat, but that's an essay competition that we run and it's, I would definitely recommend people kind of take part in that. Brilliant. Yeah, so do have a look at that link in the chat when uh, Tully puts it in there. And yeah, thanks for sharing that insight. And I think that is important that there is variety uh, in, in what an economist can do at the FCDO, but more generally. And, uh, and yes, it can potentially open doors to help use your skill set, not just in the UK, but around the world. Next up, I'm going to come to Costas uh, from KPMG. And I'd love for you, again, just to um, share your journey. Uh, KPMG may be a, a, a name that a lot of people are actually familiar with, but they might not really know why. They, they, they see it as they go to big cities across the UK and the world. Nice offices. What happens in those offices, though? Uh, yeah, over to you. Thank you. Sure, that, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, similar to Angeliki, actually, I am from Greece and I moved to Scotland around 2013 following the national high school exams to do my bachelor degree in economics at the University of Aberdeen. Then I did a postgraduate degree in finance at Warwick Business School and proceeded to work a couple of years at Nira Economic Consulting where I was supporting the regulatory finance and energy practice. So I only moved to KPMG actually in May of last year, where I'm supporting the similar practices here. Uh, initially, I didn't actually know that I was going to move abroad as well. So I, my ideas was initially potentially to study in Greece, but there were some complications on that, which potentially I could go into later and thought perhaps the best idea would be indeed to try and study in the UK where 
potentially the curriculum would be more suited to what I was interested in. So with respect to KPMG, I think it makes sense that a lot of people are aware of them or have heard of them because they're quite involved with just about everything. So there's a, they're a multinational professional services network, and they're also one of the big four accounting organizations. So you might heard of them when, if, when they're doing accounting work, management consulting work, economic consulting work. So you basically can hear their name in any field that you might be working in. And specifically for me, I'm in their regulatory finance and their competition practices. So our questions particularly relate to economic regulations. So you have a regulated market. So and there's threats and opportunities to organizations from any decisions that any regulator or even a government might make. So we will help a private company or maybe even a public sector client navigate these implications on for the next few years, basically. And we might also help them develop arguments in their interactions with regulators through our analysis or our experience with regulatory practice and make our own recommendations. And to do that, what kind of skill set do you need? And what, what kind of skill set should our audience be thinking of developing if they want to follow such a career path? That's a, that's a fair question. I think generally some rational thinking is the most important part. It's not so much that you need to have very specialized economic skills, because a lot of the time when you're dealing with a question, you mostly need to have some knowledge of the field that you're working in. What are the issues that they're trying to address? And once you know that, then you can kind of for, focus on that particular area and try to answer the question. Now, sometimes you might be thinking, I don't know how to deal with this question. Like, how do I set prices for a product? And you don't really need to know the exact answer immediately, but you can obviously study it at the same time. Because economics is not just a narrow field where you would know everything once you get into it. There's so many different questions and each different project that you deal with, you might have to deal with a separate question. But as long as you're open to learning about it, I think, and you have some logical thinking of following an arguments and how to develop it, as well as some analytical skills like doing Excel stuff or potentially programming as these things become more prevalent in this society compared to a few years ago. Now, so I think these are sufficient really to get you started. And then as you develop your own thinking, you get more into the role and understand economics a bit better. Yes. So listeners you know the, the learning definitely doesn't stop at school but there's a variety of uh, skills there so it might be the maths but the computer science as well so if you're at that stage and you've not maybe selected your options at school for a levels or scottish hires you know do consider the computer science or actually consider what you can learn at home there's so much you can do online with coding that can really boost uh, your journey in economics so one of the questions that's come through on the chat box is uh, what frustrates you in your role with economics? Are there certain things that frustrate you, certain barriers uh, that you have in your role? I mean, for me, probably it would be that you always have to address a question and it's not always quite easy because the resources are not always available or not fully available for you to get a clear answer. So you might be working in a market in Asia or around Saudi Arabia or any of the countries where information might not be as publicly available as in Europe, for example. And you might have to make your own inferences, your assumptions on how would things work. I have this information and how can I work with this to develop a coherent argument? Because obviously information is a resource that we might be thinking is always available to us because we have Google and we can find things that we're interested in just by searching. But it's not always that simple when you're looking for data to make an analysis and answer a particular question, especially when you're being hired to do this and getting paid for it. Yes. So not all the answers might be out there, or they might be. It might be tricky finding them all and getting access to all the data. Um, brilliant. And, and for, for young people sat there thinking, well, actually, you know, I'd love to go to university and in the future, I'd maybe like to work somewhere like KPMG. What kind of opportunities are there for young people at that early career stage at somewhere like KPMG? Well, I mean, apprenticeships are always an opportunity. We have secondments, even if you don't start at KPMG and you want to gain an experience, for example, in our field, we have that opportunity so you can have a secondment. We always have the graduate schemes, so 
for the ones that are just starting out, we have a very broad scheme so that you can start in economics and go into something else. So even if you, for example, might think, I don't really know where I'm supposed to end up in, KPMG really, because it's a company that covers so many areas, you can start somewhere and then you can gain experience in a variety of fields and then you can decide where do you really want to end up in. I think that's really the good of thing that KPMG offers quite a few different opportunities for everyone at different levels. That's good to hear. So yes, yeah, so you can uh, have taster uh, sessions effectively in a variety of different areas. And uh, KPMG, as I mentioned at the start, offices all around the world, but in the UK specifically, wh where could economists be working in KPMG in the UK? Wh wh which cities uh, could you be based? Uh, fair question. <laughs> so I think London would probably be the main one when it comes to the economics practice. Of course, if you're looking at KPMG in general, you might find offices just about anywhere <laughs> because of the audit and accounting and management consulting work. But for the economics, probably the main one that I'm aware of, at least, is London and internationally, of course. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, you know, you might be sat in might be based there in the southeast but you know kpmg obviously leeds manchester glasgow uh so you know lots of uh, opportunities for you to hopefully visit the offices see some of these early career uh, career opportunities and uh, engage further well thank you very much for that insight Carlos, and i'm sure we'll come back to you with further questions but thank you very much so next up i'm going to come to zar from uh, the bank of england Again, you know, Bank of England, I mean, wow, lots of you uh, at schools might be thinking, I've started reading a book actually recently from the Bank of England. Because, yeah, the Bank of England released their first ever book just before Christmas. If you've not read it yet, it did get sent to uh, all state secondary schools across the UK. So it will be in your library somewhere. An absolutely super book that asks, asks kind of what seem like simple questions, like why aren't Freddo's 10p anymore? And, you know, uh, why can't we just print more money? But yeah, Zoe, tell us a little bit more about what actually happens at the Bank of England and, and what you do there. Sure, yeah. <clears throat> and I'll um, touch yeah, a bit on my my journey to get here as well. I think sort of um, some, some of the other people on the call, uh, so yeah, so I studied economics at A-level and then, yeah, no, I want, knew I wanted to do it at university, so I went to um, University of Surrey for undergrad. Uh, switched from economics to economics and finance. They allowed the flexibility of that, which was nice. Um, so it was 25% finance. So I got a bit of both. And then, um, <clears throat> and sort of, I guess what was getting me into it as well, I think um, similar to what other, some other people have also said that, uh, yeah, so there was this sort of competition that the bank used to run. Um, while they don't run it anymore, what, uh, what the bank does run is that um, you can get uh, people from the bank come visit, come visit um, schools and sort of, do what I'm doing and tell you in, in more detail about what the bank does um, but yeah at the time yeah we had to present on like what we thought the outlook for the UK economy was going to be and whether the bank should cut or raise interest rates um, and uh, yeah so, so that's that was uh, what got me into it and then uh, what do you call it uh, yeah I did a year in industry at the University of Surrey so that was at State Street Global Markets which is a um, yeah which is a, a asset manager so yeah, that was that was a uh, nice and it was a bit different um, to what I ended up doing. But yeah, after that I went and I had actually applied to the bank quite a few times, three or four times, and this is actually not uncommon actually for when speaking to colleagues at the bank. Um, but yeah, finally got in. Uh, so I actually first couldn't find a, a job that I like I wanted after my undergrad. So I knew I wanted a master's eventually. Eventually did one, um, and then yeah, so did a master's at U UCL in economics, and eventually got into the Bank of England. So my division at the bank is called Current Economic Conditions Division. And um, what we do is basically, so if anyone's read the Monetary Policy Report, there is a section called Current Economic Conditions. So it's basically what it says on the tin, what's going on in the economy right now and what do we expect for the outlook going forward? Um, and on that, uh, so there's three particular teams. So we cover GDP, the labor market and inflation. I'm currently on the inflation team. So I work on the short term inflation forecast. Um, so yeah, inflation, um, the forecast up to six months out. Um, so yeah, that broadly covers it. Um, I see there's a question on the chat about diversity, so I'm happy to touch on that as well. Um, so, I, so I guess if you look at the current composition of the MPC, even relative to when I joined, um, if that's like one way to one way to look at it, there's obviously other facets we can look at as well. But um, 
um, relative to when I joined, I think it was back then there was one woman and they were all of the same ethnic diversity now. Um, but both facets of those have improved. There is uh, the three women um, on the MPC. And one of those um, is from a similar background to me. So Swati Dingra, who did a speech yesterday, um, which is which is nice. And more broadly, the bank has done a, uh, a court, uh, what, what was called a, a court review into ethnic diversity and inclusion. And from that has come an action plan. And there's been a really big push within the bank to uh, improve uh, diversity within, within the bank as well. Uh, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you for that. So, so yeah, so if any of you, uh, you know, kind of want to know, like, well, what's it like actually inside the bank? Well, you can actually go inside. You can visit the museum. Absolutely brilliant um, school trip. Or you can go, you know, on school holidays. And there's always a variety of activities that happen there uh, that you can get access to. Um, so another question that's come in there. So mentioned forecasting inflation, obviously a hot, hot topic at the moment. Um, what what tools do you use? Uh, you know, uh, what 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 can you give away, and what what can you maybe not tell us? But what kind of tools are you using to um, to kind of do that forecasting? Yep, sure. So, would you call it? Um, so when it comes to targeting and uh, forecasting inflation, um, we cut inflation by uh, various components. So we forecast 31 different components. Um, and obviously, they will behave in different ways. So use a range of different um, what we, econometric models for certain things. And, and we use a range of different indicators, whether they be um, from surveys, things like um, commodity prices, uh, energy prices, and those sort of things. But also, we will get intelligence from our agents. So the agents are people who work all around the country. So there'll be people in London, but there'll be people in like Northern Ireland, Scotland, and other parts like in, in Northern England as well, to get a sense of what's going on on the ground. And they'll speak to businesses. Um, so, yeah. And uh, so we try and get um, our information from a range of sources. Yeah. And so it's a mixture of maths and stats in terms of the, the particular skills. And obviously, as Sam was mentioning before, a lot of coding. So, you know, we'll have various softwares that we'll use to uh, produce our forecasts as well. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you for that. So yeah, a mixture of skill sets, mixture of uh, um, kind of platforms and people, really. People, I think, is an important one there. As you mentioned, Zan, people across uh, regions. Um, but coming back to the math, then it often is the way. You know, how important is that maths aspect? You know, how important is your mathematical ability in uh, your ability to do your role? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's an interesting question. So, so I guess just stepping back a bit. So a lot of people at the bank, um, so if I take my, my graduate cohort, for example, um, like, so I joined in the grad scheme a few years ago. Um, in, so yeah, a lot of people on graduate cohort, uh, a lot of them didn't have economics. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of careers at the bank, which may be less mathematically focused or economically focused. Um, so I guess in that regard, there is there is a lot of pathways into the bank. Um, I think the other skill, apart from so maths, can be you know is is fairly useful um, and important, and statistics as well. I would say within that um, for a lot of careers, but within the bank, but not all of them for sure. Um, and within that, I think the other the other thing which was uh, so you know, I was I was more into that sort of direction, did maths, physics, etc., like GCSE A level, etc. But uh, and I was really glad to like not do any more English. But now I look at it and I'm like, damn, I, I wish I did you know, paid a bit more attention, but just because a lot of what we do at the bank is, you know, and I imagine this is true for a lot of colleagues, like a lot of people here, is that you, no matter how good the analysis is, if you can't explain it to people in, you know, clear and coherent way, and in particular, there's an emphasis on the bank of, you know, being really concise in what you say, because like, you know, the NPC, for example, read a lot. So um, I would say English as well can be uh, particularly important and just clear drafting and writing abilities. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant, brilliant point, you know, it's one thing doing the research, finding the outcomes, but you've got to communicate that. And, and not just to fellow economists. Um, and, and on that, coming back to the Bank of England book, uh, you know, we know that not every school has an economics department, economics teachers. So if you go online on the Bank of England website, there are resources that link the book to the English curriculum, actually. So GCSE English. Um, accessible to all and you can download the, those resources so yeah communication is so important thank you for that Dar. absolutely brilliant 
Um, yeah, a couple of other questions that I've seen through the chat box, and thank you, Amrit, for answering one of them. But I'd still like to kind of put it out to uh, uh, maybe some of the panelists. So one of the questions came in going, you know, I'm giving uh, career options to a class of year 10s who are thinking of studying economics. What would you say? Amrit's given some absolutely brilliant kind of variety of uh, job titles and really varied job titles. But Polly, if I come back to you, um, what, what would you be saying to those year 10? So we're kind of looking at maybe 15 year olds. Um, what, what would you say? What, why should they do economics and what could happen next? Yeah, it's a really good question, Sam, and, and Sam has put some really good suggestions in there. I think what I also would add is that economics, it, and it goes back to something Angelica said earlier, is something that equips you to be a better political scientist or a better historian. Actually, it's a way of thinking, it's a way of problem solving, it's a different angle of approaching kind of everything we see in, in modern life and also a way of thinking about history. So I would, I would recommend economics, even if you don't want necessarily to be an economist, it might be actually really beneficial for you as a historian or if you're doing politics, international relations, a whole range of kind of cross disciplinary subjects. Um, in terms of career options, as, as, as uh, you touched on there, there's a whole range. Uh, I, I've done a couple of different jobs as an economist. And uh, as I said, some of the jobs, and even in very economic institutions like the Bank of England, some are very kind of what you might consider typical econo economists. My roles at the Bank of England or maybe less so, I was a financial supervisor supervising a bank and I was also working in a financial policy. Um, economics really helped and especially being economically literate really helped, but it wasn't my, what you might consider like a classic, you know, macroeconomist forecasting kind of role. Um, so I think, yeah, I would totally encourage people to, to study it or, or read up about it if they, if they can't. I think it's re really interesting. It really just helps you understand what's going on in the world around you. Um, and I think as, as an economist in the civil service, and as we were touching on before, a main part of this is how we communicate to non-economists. I think having economics is kind of an extra string to your bow often. You know, when you're talking to policy colleagues, you're working together on different issues. But if you kind of have that economics background, it can really just be an extra kind of a skill to your locker, um, even if you don't necessarily end up becoming, you know, what people might consider a stereotypical economist, although I don't think necessarily is one of those. So... I think there is that yeah so varied and I think even if you don't want to be a quote-unquote economist I would totally recommend it anyway to kind of to, to benefit you. Definitely and I think what I'm hearing from our panelists today is yes we're here talking about careers in economics but I'm hearing so many other subjects that are interlinked and Tolly you mentioned history there which actually yeah you know history economics in history it links so clearly and actually as it happens uh, at Discover Economics, we've been working with uh, the Cage Research Centre at Warwick University, and we've just started to release some videos that do link economics into GCSE and A-level history. So uh, video as it happens, and I, I didn't ask Tolly to do this lovely segue for me, but yeah, video as it happens came out today featuring James Robinson. So do check out our social feeds for that. So yeah, uh, this is all working absolutely lovely and, and a lovely platform to kind of build the uh, to hand into Amrit now from the University of Kent. So Amrit's a senior lecturer at the University of Kent. And I think, yeah, so now we've got a lot of young people excited, thinking, right, this is for me. Um, but yeah, what, what are we saying to them, Amrit, next? What, what is next, whether it be at university or apprenticeships? And importantly, yeah, how did you get to where you are as well? What was your journey? Yeah, my, my name is Amrit Namirapu. I'm a senior lecturer in economics at the University of Kent. And um, what I do in my job is it's about, you know, half research, half teaching. And I'm lucky that I get to teach the courses that I do research in. So I do research in development economics, which basically means that I try to understand the problems of uh, the economic problems of poor countries. And um, I get to teach that here at, at the University of Kent as well. Um, so I want to say a little bit about my journey to economics, uh, which was, like other people, not, not necessarily straightforward. Um, and the reason why I want to talk about it is I think it, 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 it is a, a common pitfall that I, that I kind of uh, fell into that, that, that I hope you know, can avoid if I, if I share my experience. Um, then I want to tell you a little bit about what you could expect to gain from studying economics. And then I want to tell you a little bit about what economics looks like at the University of Kent. I'll speak a little bit about the sort of standard undergraduate route and also about the degree level apprenticeship program that we have here. Um, and then you know, a few words about how to prepare for economics at, at, at uni. Um, so, okay, so why am I showing you a London tube map? 
um, it's it has to do with the way that I got, you know, first the way that I got turned off of economics. So um, I studied university in the US and I ended up studying physics and, and philosophy, not economics. And the reason is I took an economics class in my, in my very first year and I hated it. I thought it was really stupid. They had these really simplistic supply and demand models. And I thought this, is, this doesn't describe the world that I live in, you know, firms actually set prices. Um, and so I kind of thought it was, you know, beneath me and I, and I didn't attend class and I did really bad. I got a C, which I don't know what it would be here, but, um, you know, I, I, I didn't do very well and I, and I thought I would say something else. Um, but what I, what I learned many years later is I was making a common mistake, which is I was thinking that the models that you learn in, in, in your introductory economics courses and even later courses, I, I was thinking that what they were trying to do was to describe the world. Accurate, as accurately as possible. And that's really not the purpose of most economic models. Um, so, so look at this map. This is a, this is a, this is a model of the, of, the, of the tube system and it's not realistic. It's not the scale, the angles are not portrayed faithfully. Um, this is also a model which is much more realistic in, in, in most, in most um, senses. So if you were to sort of um, you know, be in a, uh, you know, in, in a plane looking down at London and you could see through the ground, this, this system would which much, much more accurately describe where the tube lines actually are. The problem is that this is not useful for understanding how to get from one station to another. It's a, it's a tangled knot. It would be very, very hard to start at one station and figure out what the best route is to get to another. This map, although it's much less realistic, is much more useful for that purpose. And what I would learn later on is that, you know, if, you know, that's the real purpose of an economic model. A model should be like a, a fable with a moral. Um, so there's a real art to thinking about, you know, wh what's the right way to think about a model? What's, what's the lesson I should gain from it? And it's very easy to kind of look at, look at a model and say, oh, this is not realistic and therefore it's useless. So just be aware of making that mistake. Some of you who are studying economics courses now, um, you might, you might, this thought might occur to you, but, but, but keep that in mind. All right, so that's how I got turned off of economics. How did, I, how did I get back into economics? Well, I got turned off of economics at the beginning of my university and I, and I got interested in, at the end after I'd already decided to study other things. Um, what happened is an economist came to my university and he gave this talk about development economics. And the thing I'll never forget is he, he talked about the experience of South Korea. So South Korea in, in 1960, um, the GDP per capita, the average income was about $1,000 in 2015 dollars. And that's similar to what the GDP per capita of Uganda is today. So, so in 1960, South Korea was a poor country. And then what happened is it grew, the, the, economy, the, economy, the, 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 the economy of South Korea grew at about 7% per year for four decades. Okay, and what does that mean? Well, if you're going at 7% per year, what that means is that your average income is doubling every 10 years. So it's doubling in four decades, it's doubling four times. Um, that doesn't mean that your average income is higher by eight, it's higher by 16. Doubles, doubles again, doubles again, doubles again. So in a single generation, living standards, average incomes had increased by a factor of 16. People were 16 times richer than their parents. Um, and this kind of broke my brain when I realized that this was possible. Uh, because I was born in India, I grew up partly in Nigeria, I lived there for five years, and partly in the US and the UK, and sort of, I, I, I've been exposed to these very big differences in living standards, and average incomes in Nigeria and India are much lower than in the UK or the US. Um, so I thought, well, is there something that the government in Nigeria or India could do to, to make them grow like, like South Korea? And if, and if it, they, you know, if you could do that, then the consequences for, for human welfare would be would be extraordinary and indeed in you know after South Korea China managed to do this in, in a similar fashion and we've seen this extraordinary change in in um, in in the reduction in global poverty thanks to these types of things so so thinking about these things is when I realized okay economics is is it's too interesting and important not to study so that's my journey um, what do what do you expect to get out of it well well, one, I, I, I mean, it's a, it's a fun topic and, um, you know, you see from the, the range of, of, of interesting work that the panelists are doing, um, you know, in the real world, like, you know, not like me, but where I'm sitting in, in an ivory tower, but they're actually doing these really cool things in the real world. You see that there's, there's a lot of varied things you can do. 
um, you know, why, you know, why do I think that, that, that economics allows you to do such, such interesting and varied things? Well, I think that studying economics provides you with a set of general skills. And, and I think two of the sort of general sets of skills uh, are, are data analysis and causal inference and then analytical thinking. So data analysis, um, you know, and causal inference, that's really about looking at a bunch of data, observational data, and trying to infer relationships, patterns, and in particular, trying to infer causal relationships. You know, what is the effect of one thing on another? This is really important. If the government wants to change, you know, um, a, a, a policy related to the unemployment, to unemployment, or wants to change interest rates, or wants to, um, you know, do a variety of change in ISA policy, it has to have a, a clear idea of what the effect of changing that thing is going to be on, on, on some other outcome that it cares about. And that's hard in the social sciences because it's harder to do experiments. You know, the, the bank can't say, okay, you know, they can't go into a lab and then, and then run an experiment the way that a chemist or, or, a, um, or a physicist um, could. Um, so there's a whole branch of statistics called econometrics, which is, which is something you get some training in, 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 if you study economics, that helps you think about that. And I think this is a very broad skill. You can learn how to look at observational data and infer causal relationships. You can be useful to any private company, and you can be useful in a, in a wide variety of different, um, uh, you, know, you know, even public sector, I mean, especially public sector uh, roles, as, 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 we, as we've talked about. And it also just makes you a more sophisticated consumer of, of, uh, of data. Um, the other really valuable thing that I think studying economics gives you is it, is it improves your analytical thinking and problem solving skills. Um, and this used to be an article of faith. I just felt that this is what students gained. Until a few years ago, um, a paper was written, an academic economist, uh, a, a, a bunch of economic economists wrote this paper um, trying to study the effect of studying economics on analytical thinking skills. And this is, you know, how do you do something like, like this? This is actually an example of, of causal inference um, that I was just talking about. So let's say you can measure analytical thinking skills. And in fact, there, there are these things that, um, that psychologists have developed, cognitive reflection tests that, that aim to test people's analytical thinking skills and actually have some samples if you, if you want to test yourself. Um, but but I, won't, I, won't, uh, I, won't, I won't do all of that for time. But anyway, so the, there are these sort of ways of measuring analytical thinking skills. Um, maybe at the end, I'll give you a quiz if you want. Um, and so, okay, so you can measure analytical thinking skills with this, this type of test. Now, how would you see whether studying economics actually improves your analytical thinking skills? Well, one thing you could try to do, you could think to do, is to compare the analytical thinking skills of students who have studied economics versus those that have not. But that's gonna be problematic because students don't randomly choose to take economics or other things. They selectively choose, they deliberately choose. And the types of students that choose economics courses are gonna be systematically different than those who, who don't. And maybe they'll have higher average, you know, problem solving skills to begin with or lower, it's, it's not obvious, but it's not clear that they, they should be the same. So comparing those two sets of individuals is not gonna give you an accurate representation of the effect of taking economics. So what do, these, what do these authors do? Well, they use a clever technique, which economists call differences and differences. And what they do is they measure analytical thinking skills of students before they've taken any college classes. And then they measure the analytical thinking skills again after students have chosen and taken different classes. And what they find is that students, you know, after any, almost any university course improves your analytical thinking skills. Uh, it turns out that students in non-economics courses, their analytical thinking, analytical thinking skills went up by about 7.5%. So, you know, most courses will help improve your analytical thinking skills. And maybe it's just a matter of maturity and growing up as well. But um, taking economics courses will improve your analytical thinking skills even more. So, you know, twice as much. So what they're doing by doing this comparison is they're not looking at the, at the change in a particular period of time. They're looking at, they're looking at um, the change in analytical thinking skills over time between different courses. And in that way, you can difference out any initial differences in analytical thinking skills. That's why it's called differences and differences. So this is an example of, of a, you know, a data analysis technique that people can use to try to infer the effect of of one thing on another, and it's something that you get training in if you study economics. 
Um, and uh, as a little dig to my colleagues in the business, you know, in the business school, I, I will point out that that um, the study did not find a similar improvement for for taking a business class. So, um, I'm going to get in trouble for saying that, but that's that's what the data say. All right, so that's sort of conceptually what I what I think you can expect to gain from studying economics at the university level. Um, let's talk dollars and cents or pounds and pence. Um, so. It turns out that the causal impact of studying economics on your earnings is higher than any other degree if you're a man. Um, for men, your average return from studying uh, economics, uh, what that implies is that your average income is going to be, for the average person, something like 35% higher at age 29 than, than it would have been if you hadn't taken any, any um, university uh, courses at all. And there's a great variation in subjects. You know, the, the returns to studying different things are very, very big, um, and the highest for economics for men. I'll get to women in a second. So I should point out that this is this is again an example of a difficult data analysis problem. What is the causal effect of studying economics? It's not an easy question to answer because people don't study subjects randomly. They systematically choose different subjects, and the students who are compelled to study medicine or economics or psychology may be systematically different in terms of their earning potential. Um, and so these authors, uh, this is an Institute of Fiscal Studies report, these authors have done their best to try to grapple with this issue and, and, and use the, the, the most sophisticated econometric techniques to solve this problem. And I don't have time to tell you what they do, but, but you're welcome to go check out this report and, and, and see for yourself. Um, as far as I know, for this is the most well done subject which is relevant to, to, you know, to students in the UK for thinking about the returns to different subjects. Okay, so for women, the, the thing that you could study to maximize your potential earnings is actually medicine. Um, but economics is number two. After medicine, economics is the highest return. And the returns are even higher than for men. So if you're um, uh, economics, your average returns are going to be about, you're going to earn about 60% more than you would have if you hadn't taken any um, any, any, any university education. So for, for both men and women, university can be an expensive affair, but the returns are, are very high from studying certain things and certainly economics is one of those things. Um, so, and I should say, this, there's, this, is, a, this is an average. Of, so there's a, there's a big distribution. Some people will earn a lot more, some people will earn less, um, but on average, these are, these, are the, these are the effects. Okay, so you know, hopefully I've convinced you that studying economics in general is, is, is a sensible proposition, um, fun and remunerative and, and, and intellectually engaging. Um, so what, is it, what does it look like to study economics at, at, um, at undergraduate level? Um, well, I can tell you a little bit about the course structure here at the University of Kent. And I will say that um, in most places um, in the UK, the structure is gonna be quite similar. Um, so it's not, it's not that, you know, the, the particular offerings may vary a little bit, but, but um, and my understanding from what I've learned about other, other places is that it, what I'm telling you here is going to be reasonably accurate, uh, reflective of what it would be like to study economics at a different university as well. So the basic structure here at the University of Kent is that you begin by studying an introduction to micro and macroeconomics. These courses do not assume that you have had any economics before. So you don't have, have to have any economics training. You, you, know, you, you begin with the assumption that you don't know anything. If you know something, that's great. Um, that might make these somewhat easier. It can also be a little dangerous because you might think that you understand everything, and then at some point, halfway through the term, you realize, wait a minute, this is this is a little bit more sophisticated. Um, in year one, you also get uh, some training in, in the basic math that you need. It's you know what you roll, all you really need is sort of algebra and basic basic calculus, and that you will you'll be taught um, um, in year one. Although the better background, the, the better the back, if your math background coming in, the kind of the easier it will be. Um, you also get courses in data analysis and statistics. Um, and then there's some courses on employability and, and there are some electives you can take in year one. In year two, what happens is there's a real kind of narrowing and a focusing. Um, you, you sort of take a deep dive, deep dive into microeconomic theory and macroeconomic theory. You learn sort of the core of those ideas. And um, that, you know, this is really like gathering sort of the, the, the critical tools that you need. Um, and it's a little bit like, you know, taking medicine or exercising, not the most fun thing in the world, at least not 
stuff for me, but, um, but, it, but it's really valuable because then once you have this core background in macro, micro and macro theory um, and in econometrics, you can go into year three with this sort of set of tools and you can use it to apply, you can, you can apply those tools in a, in a wide variety of different areas. So firstly, you can do a dissertation or an extended essay, which can, which is often to do with data analysis and you, you apply your econometric tools to study some novel problem. And you can, you can use this micro and macro theory tools to study issues in behavioral economics or financial economics. At Kent, we have two different financial economic courses development economics, trade, human capital, political economy, all these are different elective courses that you can take, which allow you to kind of um, to really shape the degree to, 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 you know, to follow your interests. Um, and so environmental economics, economic growth, financial crises, there are all these like, different, different sort of um, uh, courses you can take. Um, at Kent, we also have different um, sort of versions of the economics degree. Of course, we have straight up economics, but then we also have a course called economics and big data. We're one of the few universities that offers this. It's joint with the computer science de uh, department. So you take some courses in programming in the computer science department, you get an introduction to machine learning and AI, um, and then you learn how to apply those to, um, to economic questions using big data. We have uh, joint courses in economic and, economics and finance um, uh, programs where you, you, you take a lot of finance along with the economics courses. Um, econ with econometrics, um, that's where you take sort of all the econometrics courses and you get the, the strongest background on that. You can do study abroad, you can do a year in industry in your third year before stage three. Um, you can take economics with a language. Um, I think Jack Meaning are, 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 are Currently, famous alumna, alumnus who, who's at the Bank of England who just wrote this book that Sam was telling about. He, I think, he did economics with Spanish. Um, anyway, so that's what the structure looks like, and I'm happy to say that um, I think, according to the students, we seem to be doing a reasonable job. Um, they're, for the most part, pretty satisfied with with um, with with their experience at Kent. Um, and you know, to answer one of the questions from the from the uh, chat earlier. Um, our alumni, they get jobs in a wide variety of different areas. So, you know, they wind up in the private sector. Well, sure, they find jobs in banks and consultancies and insurance um, companies, as you might imagine. But they also wind up, maybe most of them wind up in non-finance companies that you wouldn't necessarily think about. Places like Amazon, General Electric, Marks and Spencers, Mercado, TaskRabbit, all these private companies, um, they often hire economists to do, to do certain things for them. Um, so... And then, of course, as the public sector, our students have been placed in, in, in places like the Government Economic Service, the Bank of England, um, the Competition Markets Authority, the Ministry of Defense, um, the Treasury. And some of them wind up in NGOs, um, including we placed a student recently at the World Economic Forum. And then we even have some entrepreneurs. One of my, um, one of my, my students from Development Economics a couple of years ago, she started her own perfume company. Uh, which looks to be very successful. So, um, and, and you know, I, I like to, yeah. According to her, you know, uh, her training in back in economics has been has been useful, you know, from the perspective of, of, a, of an entrepreneur. So the other thing, um, the other way that you might think about studying economics is through a degree apprenticeship, and this is a really exciting um, possibility um, because it allows you to get join the join the you know start your career right away instead of waiting for three years. Um, so what uh, the degree apprenticeship program looks like, this is exclusively at Kent, um, is it's a four-year program in which you, you work for an employer uh, most of the time, and then part-time, one day a week, you, you, um, you study. Um, and you're taking two economics modules per term, um, 30 credits. And mostly it's distance learning because you're working you know, on the job that's located wherever your employer wants it to be located in the UK. Um, and um, so you're learning online, but there are regular in-person meetups. So I think something like twice a term, the meetups either in Canterbury with the University of Kansas or in London or in Leeds. Um, and there's a standard curriculum for this. So you'll learn the same things that you, that you would study in um, a standard undergraduate course. It's just that you focus on the core courses because there's less, there's less time, there's less, there's less credits to take. Um, so you don't get the electives. Um, so that's, the, I think, the, the kind of the cost. <clears throat> um, and the way that you would, if this is what you're interested in, you could, if you're already um, an employee with a company, you can apply through them, 
or if you're a student, you can apply to the degree apprenticeship via a particular employer. Um, so I'll give you a link, for example, for the government economic service, um, but, but it varies based on the, based on the employer. Um, and that's maybe the, maybe the best way to apply if you know you're interested in this and you're, and you're still a student. Some of our current employers include the government economic service, that's a big one, um, the Bank of England, the Competition Markets Authority, private companies like Oxford Economics, a consulting company, um, Jacobs, Arup, an engineering consulting company. And then there are some students who are from local and regional councils. Um, and one of the really cool things um, talking to some of these students is that they are studying economics one day a week and they're working in their amazing organizations like the Bank of England um, four days a week. And what that means is they can get to work and applying their knowledge right away. So there are students who in stage one who are helping to design anti-poverty programs in Oxford. So that is like, to me, it's just so exciting because, you know, we're, we're teaching these things in theory and right away they get to apply it. Um, whereas, you know, if you do with standard group then you have to you learn everything and you got to wait until you get into the job market. Um, some other students are currently, they're using macroeconomic models to forecast the effects of new free trade agreements. Some of them are studying the mental health costs of, uh, of, of, of waiting time for universal credit. And here's a link on the, on the GES. Um, and the last thing I, I, I want to say, just sorry, Sam, I'm going a little bit over, <laughs> is, is uh, just to say, if you're, if you're wondering about how to prepare for economics, I won't say much about this. Basically, don't, you don't need to worry. Um, uh, in general, and you especially don't need to worry if you haven't studied economics um, at all. It's not necessary. If you have, that's great. Um, the only advice I would say is it probably helps to try to improve your math. Uh, but if you're, you know, somebody who feels trepidatious about math, don't worry about that too. Um, you know, there'll be math classes in stage one, so you can learn what you need to know. And if you feel unsure about it, you know, you can do it. Everyone is capable if they if they're, if they're willing to put in a little bit of work. Um, you don't need a very sophisticated level of math. Um, you know, if you're willing to to put in some work, you can you can get to the level that you need in order to to learn the material. And then the last advice, echoing what was um, said by Zara a little earlier, is uh, the other advice I would give in addition to improving your math is read as much as you can, especially literature. I think that's a great way to sort of learn about the world. You know, economists should be as knowledgeable as they can about different aspects of the world and different aspects of society. Study other subjects as much as you can, you know, things like psychology and political science and history. Um, you know, be as knowledgeable as you can about different aspects of the, of the world. All those things make you a better economist, just like studying economics can make you a better historian. Um, and, and of course, reading will improve your writing and communication skills, which are so important for an economist. Um, and, uh, and that's all. And the last thing I'll say is thank you very much. Um, here's, um, you know, again, related to a question Zara got about forecasting. Here's, um, here's my, last, my last slide. Uh, but I uh, apologize for going over and thanks so much uh, for uh, for being here. That is uh, absolutely super, Amrit. So thank you so much and no need to apologize for going over all really, really important guidance. Um, and, you know, I think it's fascinating that the study has been done. And of course, it's been done because we're economists that proves it does improve your analytical thinking. So, you know, there you go. Absolutely brilliant. Um, and, you know, a lovely way to finish, I think, uh, Amrit, with your top tip there. So, yeah, I'm, I just ask, for, you know, what would your top tip be to our audience? So we heard some of the guidance there from Amrit. But if I come back to you, Tolly, just a super quick top tip for our audience. Always, if you're ever not sure about something, apply for it, go for it. Sometimes you think you're not going to get the job or not going to get the application whether it's economics, whether it's a job, whether it's something completely different, always put your hat in the ring, go for it. Brilliant. Yes, always put your hat in the ring. That's a good way to think about it. And next that. So I'd say just go into economics with an open mind, just open to discourse and conversations. No one has the perfect answer to anything. Just, about, I mean, in today's world, so just be open to having these conversations and discussions to learn more. Thank you very much. And finally, Zah, your top tip. Thanks. Um, I would say <clears throat> be curious. Try and, you know, th there's so many different avenues as, you know, as you've sort of seen from this sort of talk um, of places where you can read, you know, either reading books, um, of a curious mind is, you know, a classic film. Um, 
related to economics. There's you know podcasts I really I quite like the Economist podcast for example, which is free to listen to. Um, so yeah, just be curious and just read about on all these sort of issues because they're related to things which we all experience as well. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think yes, that's a that's a lovely. Uh word curious i think that fits perfectly with hopefully our audience and what you can be doing in the future um so yeah so loads of activity on um, on the chat box apologies if we didn't get to all your questions we will share those with the panelists afterwards and try and get some answers um but yeah so much that you can be doing i hope you've really enjoyed this activity as part of national careers week don't let it stop here though do check out our website. Do check out links that have been shared in the chat. You know, if you're a school teacher and you want Discovery Economics uh, workshops in your school, then do get in touch. My colleague Anisha shared her email there. And we can have undergraduates from a variety of universities come to your school and tell you more. Um, but thank you. It is really appreciated. We hope you've enjoyed this event. Uh, and yes, let's keep this conversation going. Thank you very much to our panelists for sharing those all, you know, interesting and unique insights. Uh, it is massively appreciated. So take care, everyone. And uh, yes, we will see you soon, no doubt. All the best. Goodbye.